Hello, everybody. Um, Valerie Scudney, I'm the co-leader for the Somerset County chapter. And thank you all for joining us tonight for Marianne Borges' presentation on wildflowers in winter. And this is such a perfect time to be talking about this since we are between two snowstorms. Uh, Mary Ann is a naturalist and photographer an author and an educator. And she is the editor of the Butterfly Gardener magazine. She's a naturalist. Uh, she's a naturalist and an instructor at Bowman's Hill Wildflower Preserve and a Pennsylvania master naturalist. She is the team leader for the Lambertville Goes Wild and a volunteer organization, a volunteer organization that successfully led the city of Lambertville to a certification as a community wildlife habitat by the National Wildlife Federation. At her blog, thenaturalweb.org, Marianne writes about and illustrates with her photography, the importance of native plants for all life, to all life. Um, just a few housekeeping items, please mute your screen so we don't have any background noise. And the recording, uh, the webinar is being recorded and it will be available on the Native Plant Society's YouTube channel if you want to watch it again. Uh, I'll put the um, the YouTube channel in the chat so you can uh, look at it later. If you have any questions, please put them in the chat uh, and we will be monitoring them and get to the questions at the end. So go ahead, Mary Ann. Thank you, Val, um, and welcome everybody. Thanks for attending. Um, as Val said, we are actually having winter this winter. How unusual, we really haven't had much winter in the last few years, um, but I know Right outside my windows, the ground snow covered for a change. Um, I did see lots of uh, tracks and signs, so that's kind of fun. But we're going to talk today about wildflowers in winter, or native plants, basically in winter. Um, we're going to—I'm going to talk a little bit about the role that native plants play. Um, it's really important to leave them standing in your garden because they do lots of things, both for us and for the wildlife that we live with. Um, we're, I'm also going to talk about some characteristics that you can use to identify wildflowers in winter. In winter, instead of the flowers, we're going to be more interested in the fruit that may still be visible on, on the plants that we see. And also the um, inflorescence types, which typically would be the flower clusters, but in this case, again, it'll be the fruit clusters. Um, I'll talk about some herbaceous plants, some common species, and just some personal favorites because you're kind of at my my mercy here. Um, a few shrubs and brambles, and um, at the end, I'll talk a little bit about where you can learn more. First of all, what role do native, native plants play in the winter? They're continuing to work. They're above ground parts. Um, you know, they're not uh, doing the same sort of thing that you would expect during the growing season, but they still continue to work. They may still be dispersing their own fruit, um, sometimes with the assistance of animals who help them to disperse that fruit. Um, for example, you know, berry producing plants um, may be eaten by birds or other animals who may then disperse the seeds later on. Some are actually able to photosynthesize even in the winter, and we'll see at least a few examples of that. Um, for animals, uh, the plants that are left standing, whether they're herbaceous plants or whether they're woody species, offer shelter for insects, birds, and other animals. The photo that you see on the right-hand side of the, this uh, slide is um, a cocoon of a promethea moth, a large silk moth. And the cocoon that you see is the way that the insect survives the winter. It's um, attached to a stem. It looks like a curled up leaf. It's a perfect disguise, but it needs to have that platform to, to have the uh, cocoon on. Um, it, the plants provide food for insects, birds, and other animals. Um, there's still a lot of eating going on even in the winter. If you ever watch the birds outside your windows or when you go for a walk, they're um, not just going to bird feeders and they're not just, eat they may be eating fruits and seeds from plants that are standing. So that's really important. Um, they're also looking for insects that may be overwintering there. So there's a lot of um, food chain stuff going on. Plants also are uh, offering nest material for the next season that's coming up. Just about two months from, uh, from now would be the first day of spring. So. Uh, that it won't be long before the nesting material will be needed. 
And for us, there's plenty of interest in your garden uh, uh, during the winter if we leave um, our herbaceous plants standing and watch all the interactions between those plants and the, the, uh, the critters that we see. So to identify wildflowers in winter, um, there are similar characteristics to what you might use during the growing season. One would be the inflorescence type. Inflorescence is usually a term used to refer to the flower cluster. In this case, it's gonna be the remains of the flower cluster, um, often with some visible fruit left. Um, it may be that there'll be a single flower, perhaps at the tip of a stem or a single um, cluster of fruits. Um, if there is a cluster, what is the shape of that cluster that can help you to identify it? Um, there are different fruit types. Typically, when you hear the word fruit, I think we've all kind of been brainwashed as kids to think fruit means things like um, berries, but that's not the only kind of fruit. There are many types of fruit, some that are fleshy fruits like berries, but others that are um, dry fruits um, that have more of a hard outer coating. And we'll see many examples of that. Um, some of the other characteristics that we'll be relying on to identify plants in the winter are the calyx, that is the collection of sepals, the receptacle. Um, I'll show you in a minute what the receptacle is, if you don't recall. It's basically the platform for the flowers. Um, and the bracts that would be encasing flowers in the growing season. And now they may still be visible and um, a useful characteristic to identify the, the plants that you're seeing. Um, if the leaves are present, they're, as they are in the growing season, a good way to help identify a plant. You may see plants with evergreen leaves or deciduous leaves. Even plants with deciduous leaves, they may still be sometimes clinging to the stalks. If not, you can probably at least see leaf scars where the leaves were attached. So, you know, whether those leaves are opposite or alternate or whorled are useful identification characteristics. If the leaves are present, the usual, are they toothed around the edges or not? Entire means they're not toothed. Um, are there basal leaves, leaves just at the base of the plant or at the base of the plant in addition to along the stem? All those are useful characteristics. The stem of the plant itself, what's its shape? Round, square, triangular, flat. Um, is it branched? If it is branched, is the branching opposite or alternate? What is the texture? Use your fingers, feel it. What is the texture of it? Is it smooth or rough or maybe, excuse me, hairy? Some plants may offer a scent even in the winter. Think mint family members. You may still be able to get a, a hint of the mint fragrance from the plant. And as always, what habitat are you seeing something in? And speaking of habitat, um, many species, not all, but Many species have been assigned a uh, wetland classification by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, this helps to identify a plant. If you're in a wetland and you find a clear trying to identify a plant, and you think it's something that's almost always found in an upland, rethink your identification and vice versa. So this can be a useful identification characteristic. Let's just review um, the structure of a flower for a second. Um, if we start at the outside of the flower, the first uh, whorl of flower parts that may be present are sepals that typically act as sort of protective bud scales before the flower opens. But in many cases, they're still present um, in a dried form in the winter. Um, next whorl in would be petals, which we're typically not gonna be seeing in the winter. Next whorl in would be the male reproductive parts, the stamens, and the next whorl, or the, yeah, potentially one or more um, pistils or, or uh, carpels, the female reproductive parts would be at the very center. In the case of, um, of the classic flower, all of these flower parts are resting on a receptacle at the tip of the flower stem. In the case of aster family members, um, many tiny little flowers, potentially disc flowers and or ray flowers are resting on a shared receptacle. And in the case of the ester family members, there are a few that the receptacle is actually quite distinctive in the winter, um, perhaps combined with the bracts that uh, surrounded the flowers before the, the uh, flower cluster opened. So we'll see a few examples of that. The inflorescence types, the, um, the skeletal 
uh, remains of the plants, you're going to be looking for the same types of uh, characteristics in the flower cluster in the winter that you would have in the, the growing season. The cluster may have been in the form of a panicle, which is a branched flower cluster or inflorescence, in uh, and which each flower, and in this, the winter case, fruit, has its own stem or uh, attaching it to the main um, branch of the, the inflorescence. It may be a raceme, which is an un branched flower cluster. And again, each flower would have had its own stem and thus each fruit may have its own stem. Or it could be a spike. Uh, this is again, an unbranched flower cluster where the flowers did not have um, a stem. They were attached directly to the main stem of the flower cluster and therefore the remaining fruits will as well. Um, a little more, a little different shaped. The corum is a rounded inflorescence rather than an elongated one and where the stems of each flower were um, of different lengths. They tend to be longer on the outside of the cluster and shorter on the inside. Um, the uh, umbel is again a rounded cluster where each of the stems for the flowers were of about equal length. And then there are flower heads where there are many um, densely clustered flowers. And again, in the case of winter, it would be fruits. Um, so we're going to be looking for fruits to help us identify plants. So the, the uh, flowers, if they were successfully pollinated, will have produced fruit and often, not always, but often some of that fruit will be remaining visible on the plant, at least through some of the winter. Um, it's the ovary that typically um, is magically transformed into a fruit. But interestingly, flowers, a single flower can have more than one ovary. And so uh, while each ovary can become a fruit, it might also be a chamber of the fruit. If, if a flower has more than one ovary, um, then the, um, each one will be a chamber or a, a part of the fruit. Um, the fertilized ovules mature to become seeds. Um, sometimes additional parts of the flower are incorporated into this transformation from fruit to fruit. Um, in that case, those flowers are referred to as accessory fruits. Um, there's also aggregate fruits, and this is something that's produced by um, flowers that have multiple ovaries. So raspberries and black blackberries are uh, examples of aggregate fruits. And there are multiple fruits which are formed uh, when the uh, ovaries of multiple flowers uh, combine to um, produce a fruit. An example of that that we can see in the natural world is uh, skunk cabbage fruits. And we'll see that a little bit later in the presentation. So fruit types, again, I don't know about you, but I was kind of brainwashed to think that fruits are fleshy things, but not all fruits are fleshy. Um, there are some fruits that are fleshy. They typically have a soft outer wall. Um, a berry is a good example, but not the only example. Uh, some types of fleshy fruits also may have a somewhat tougher outer coat, and I'll give you a couple of examples of those in a minute. However, there's a whole other category of fruits that are dry fruits, referred to as dry fruits. Fruits that have a um, a non-fleshy outer wall, um, often a hard outer wall, um, some of which are dehiscent, that is they open to produce, to release their seeds and disperse their seeds when the fruit is ripe. Others are indehiscent, that means the fruit remains closed even when the fruit is ripe and ready for dispersal. And we'll see examples of all of these. So, did you know that in addition to the typical berry, such as a blueberry, there are other variations of that? A, a typical berry is a fleshy fruit that has a soft outer wall and skin, and it most likely contains multiple seeds, um, probably throughout the fruit. An example of that is a blueberry, my personal favorite. However, there's a couple of other odd variations or to me a little bit unexpected when I first learned of them. One is a pepo, which is um, a berry, a fruit with um, a soft wall that has a hard outer skin. 
and that may contain multiple seeds inside. Examples of that are watermelon and cucumbers. A Hesperidium is a type of berry that has a soft wall and it has a leathery outer skin and thin papery partitions, uh, and it may contain multiple seeds. You're familiar with those as uh, citrus fruits are some examples, oranges, lemons, and limes. Believe it or not, even bananas are Hesperidium. Um, but there are some, so those other variations aren't terribly common in the native plants that we see around us. In fact, I can't give you any examples, but there are some other examples um, of fleshy fruits that are quite common. A droop is very common. The viburnum fruits are all droops. Um, they look like berries. They have a soft outer wall. Um, the skin is soft, but the seed is encased in a stony pit, much like a peach. So that is um, a droop. Um, again, the viburnum fruits are all droops. A palm is a soft wall, has a soft wall and outer skin, and the seeds are enclosed in a papery core. Think apple. Apples are an example of a palm. Um, a hip, think rose hip, you've probably heard that term, has a soft outer wall and outer skin that's derived from um, other flower parts in addition to the um, ovaries. And that's derived from the receptacle and it encloses multiple achene, which is a dry fruit that I'm about to tell you about. Um, first, we'll talk about the dehiscent dry fruits, those that open on their own when they're ripe and ready to disperse their seeds. One that you may be familiar with is a legume think key family members. Um, they contain a chamber with multiple seeds. Sometimes the legume fruits are segmented and sometimes those segments can actually split apart, but it's basically one chamber with multiple seeds. The wall, the outer wall is dry and to open it splits along both sides of that fruit. And again, just think of pea family members that you maybe uh, take these, the uh, strings off of peas or, or string beans before serving. That Those are the places, the two sutures where the legumes open on their own when the fruit is ripe. Um, a follicle is um, a dry fruit that opens on its own along one wall and sort of opens like a book. So as if there were a hinge at the other side. The milkweed uh, um, fruit is are examples of follicles. There will be multiple seeds and a dry outer wall. Again, they open on one suture, not multiple. Um, a capsule has um, two or more chambers. So that means that they're produced by flowers that had two or more ovaries. Um, each chamber will have multiple seeds, um, dry outer walls, and they split along either horizontal or vertical sutures, um, sometimes pores, um, and sometimes both. I have one example of both, so which is kind of a favorite of mine because it's kind of such a cool fruit. You'll know when we get there. Um, another example of a capsule is a silique, which is a type of fruit that is produced by um, many mustard family members. Um, probably the one that all of us are unpleasantly familiar with is garlic mustard. Um, it's a long, narrow capsule. It'll open along um, uh, the both sides of the capsule and the seeds are along a center partition, attached to the center partition. If the capsules are still visible in the winter and there are some native mustard family members that have produced the leaks, you can sometimes see the impression of where the seeds were attached to that center partition. Sometimes a few of the seeds are even still lingering there. A silicle is very similar to a silic, but just a shorter shape. And again, each chamber in a multi-chambered uh, fruit is the result of an ovary. A keen, I mentioned just a moment ago, this is a type of fruit that probably is uh, most commonly seen uh, in in Astor family members, big sunflower seed. Um, and a keen has a solid fruit, has a, a solitary seed that's lightly attached to a dry outer wall. 
often with um, a pappus attached. And the pappus is uh, a device that the plant produces to help disperse the seed. It might be a light fluffy thing like an umbrella that helps the seed travel by the, be dispersed by the wind. Or it might be more of a hook shape that would uh, help the seed be dispersed by grabbing, hitching a ride on a passing animal, sometimes even us. Um, a caryopsis is a type of fruit that's produced by um, grass family members, um, and it's a grain. The samara is a single seed enclosed in a dry outer wall um, that extends beyond that to produce a wing, again, typically to help the, the fruit be dispersed by the wind. And good examples of that are um, uh, maples and ash. Uh, the nut is another typical fruit. Think any kind of nut, whether black uh, walnut, um, hickory nuts, even acorns are nuts. And there are some plants that produce tiny little nuts referred to as nutlets. Um, the schizocarp is a type of fruit that has two chambers. They split it apart when they're mature and each contains a single seed. And it's the carrot or parsley family members that have this type of fruit. We're gonna skip by questions for now and look at some of the common plants that we may see in winter. First, we're gonna look at a few that are more, you know, meadow species you see in the sunny areas. And the first of which is one of my personal favorites because I just think it's really pretty in winter. Um, this is New York ironweed. Uh, you may see this, these plants still standing in the winter. Um, the dry leaves may still be clinging to these stems. And at the tips, you'll see the remains of the flower clusters. New York ironweed is an aster family member. And so there are many uh, densely packed flower heads, which is what we're seeing here um, in the, the photograph. What we're seeing are fruits that are in the picture with the full plant are fruits that are still attached to the plant. And here we can see if we take a look in the uh, upper right, that they have this fluffy um, umbrella-like stuff attached that helps those fruits or seeds be dispersed by the wind. Um, once they are dispersed, it's really easy to um, um, identify the plants even by the remains of the flower that are there. What we see right next to this flower head that um, has, uh, has its remaining seeds is um, one with an empty receptacle. And you can see the scars from where the flowers were attached. Um, and uh, surrounding it, looking almost like petals, are the bracts, the dried bracts that were encasing the flowers before they opened to bloom. So it's just a really easy to identify plant. Um, the leaves, if you if you still need the leaves to identify it, they're simple, that is, they're not compound. They mostly don't have teeth and they're sessile. That is, they don't have a stem, they're attached directly to the main stem of the plant. Um, New York ironweed does prefer moisture habitats. Joe pine weed has a different look. Um, the, how, the heads, individual heads are much smaller, but there are many of them. The entire inflorescence is quite large, um, branched and porum-like. Um, the the um, flower clusters are attached to different places along the stem. Again, the fruit is an akene and it has what botanists refer to as a bristly pappus, that light fluffy stuff that helps them to be carried in the wind. The leaves are whorled multiples around the same uh, location on the stem. If they're not clearly visible and if they're not still attached, you may be able to see um, the leaf scars. And there are four species that are native in our area. Uh, three of them prefer moisture soils. Um, Eutrochium purpureum can tolerate drier sites. Um, the goldenrods, there are close to 30 species that are native in our area. And um, I'm just referring to uh, some of the more common species that would be meadow species, but these other goldenrods will share some of the same characteristics. Um, those that I'm referring to here have a single main stem that's branched at the top. Um, the individual heads are relatively small. 
um, the entire inflorescence may be um, spreading, it may be pyramidal, and that'll kind of vary depending on the species. Again, as is the case with many aster family members, the fruit is an achene with a light fluffy pappus attached. Um, the leaves are simple and alternate. Depending on the species, um, they may have more texture or less. They may be toothed or not. Um, we'll see goldenrods in all kinds of habitats. The goldenrods we tend to see most frequently um, are also housing insects during the winter. First of all, the, the seeds that we're seeing or the fruits that we're seeing that contain the seeds may be eaten by birds and other um, animals. But they're also potentially housing many insects um, somewhere in the remains of the plant. And some of the most obvious um, are those that uh, produce galls on these the, um, the goldenrods. A really common gall is the goldenrod bunch gall, which is caused by a midge that um, burrows into the stem. It basically stops the growth of the stem at that point. Often the plant will continue to grow by branching around it and will continue to flower. But you see something that almost looks like a, a rosette of leaves stopped at one place. That's the result, that's a gall produced by the um, uh, gall midge, goldenrod gall midge. And a gall, if you're not familiar with it, is a plant's reaction to being used by an insect as a source of food and shelter. Um, the insect's presence triggers the plant to to um, have uh, to produce chemical changes that um, produce a different growth pattern, also typically produces food and shelter for that insect, and the insect's able to feed inside there. Um, and probably the next most common, oh, this one I should say, is so common, the midge gall is so common that I've seen it on even um, some of the uh, shade goldenrods, um, Wreath goldenrod, for example, in my own garden, I've seen this, this um, gall. Probably the next most common is the goldenrod ball gall, um, which is caused by a fly. Again, the um, insect develops inside this growth. The growth is triggered by the presence of the insect. The insect's able to um, feed inside there based on the tissue that's produced. It also potentially houses a bunch of other insects that some of which are just freeloaders, they're also in there eating, some of which are eating the original insect that caused the gall. And we see a hole here. And that's because even in the winter, birds are looking for insects to eat. It's not just during the uh, warm, month, warm weather months that um, birds are looking for insects. Both chickadees and downy woodpeckers have learned that this gall is potentially a really productive source of protein in the middle of winter. Um, this neat, sort of neat pole indicates that it's probably a downy woodpecker. Chickadees are a little sloppier with their digging when they try to open in there to get the insect. And then a third gall, which I found is somewhat less common, is the elliptical gall caused by the goldenrod gall moth. This one is pretty much restricted to two species, Solidago gigantea and Altissima. Um, the ball gall is known to use Gigantea, Altissima, Rugosa, and possibly others, and is much more common, I find. Um, elephant's foot is not a super common plant in the wild in our area, but um, because we're kind of the northern end of its range, but it, it does really well here. It's an aster family member, has small clusters of um, sort of ice blue flowers, blooms in late summer, early fall, with a very stiff stem. The flower clusters are the tips of these branches. And in the winter, um, we can look for this um, branched inflorescence or flower cluster with clusters of heads at their tips, sort of triangularly shaped. And what we're seeing here are the dried calyxes, um, the collection of sepals that enclosed the flowers and the achenes, again, an aster family member would be inside. Uh, tick seed sunflower, we're seeing a different dispersal mechanism. Here's another aster family member. Um, again, the fruits are achenes. Um, this tick seed sun, oops, typo here, sunflower. Um, the, uh, the, the flower, the inflorescence is branched. Each flower um, 
produces a head because it's comprised of many tiny little flowers. Um, it's usually the disc flowers that are fertile, that are able to be uh, fertilized and produce fruits. And here we see that they there are many achenes produced. Um, instead of the light fluffy pappas, we see sort of a hook-shaped pappas um, that is used to hitch a ride to try to uh, disperse the fruit to get uh, um, hitch a ride on an animal. Perhaps you've had some on your clothing. The milkweeds, um, they typically have a single main stem that is usually branched at the top. The inflorescence, um, there'll be a flower cluster at the tips of the branches, multiple flower clusters. The fruit is a follicle. That is um, the kind of uh, uh, fruits that open up sort of like a book. Um, the leaves for common milkweed and swamp milkweed are mostly entire, not toothed. Um, or all of them are mostly entire. And the first two, common milkweed and swamp milkweed, are opposite. Butterfly weed, they're mostly alternate. Um, we'll find uh, common milkweed and uh, butterfly weed in drier habitats and swamp milkweed in more moist habitats. And to tell the difference when they're in fruit in the winter, even after they've dispersed all the seeds, they open up to disperse their seeds. And the uh, common milkweed fruit capsule um, will typically be sort of warty, maybe yellow inside. And um, the butterfly weed is a, a thinner outer coating. They, the stems have a little bit of a hook shape to them. And swamp milkweed has, uh, they have distinct lines on the outside and the stems that support them are upright. So you can tell them apart even in the winter. Indian hemp uh, has a single main stem that may be branched at the top. Um, they, the fruits are almost always in twos and that's because the flowers have two ovaries. Uh, they apparently don't share the whole wall. They just uh, share a couple of points at which they're attached. The fruit is a follicle, much like milkweeds, Indian hemp, uh, the dog veins and milkweeds are in the same family. Um, and again, the fruit opens up to disperse the seeds, which are have light fluffy pappas attached. The leaves at present are simple, entire and opposite. And Indian hemp actually is happy in many different habitats. Um, although this says it kind of prefers somewhat drier soils, I've also seen it along uh, lake edges. So it, it really, you may see it in many different places, often in meadows. The mountain mints are really pretty in winter. I have an, as an example here, hoary mountain mint. Um, they all have sort of a steely gray appearance. Um, and as mint family members all do, they have square stems and opposite branching. So that's a good characteristic to look for. All of the mint family members may also have um, still some minty fragrance, especially if you rub your fingers against them. Um, Every mountain mint, you'll typically see multiple tiers of flowers. Um, short toothed mountain mint, also called clustered mountain mint, um, typically there's not as much in the way of tiers, you'll typically see a lot of flower clusters at the same level of height. And what we see here as the remains of the flowers are the dried calyx tubes at the tips of the branches. The fruits are tucked inside and they're teeny little nutlets. Um, they're inside the calyx. The leaves, as the mint family members are, are opposite. And you'll find this in uh, meadows and thickets. Wild bergamot and um, bee balm would both look pretty similar in the winter. Again, the typical um, stems of the mints, which is a square stem, opposite branching or opposite leaves. And in this case, the leaves are gone, but you can kind of still see that the leaf scars. So that's, if you needed it, that's another way to identify the arrangement of the leaves on the plant. The inflorescence or flower, flower cluster would be dense heads of um, 
calyx tubes that have been fused to, to form a tube, and they have five lobes at the tips of those tubes. Again, the fruit is um, four nutlets inside the calyx. Um, another kind of really pretty uh, mint family member in the winter is hairy wood mint. In this case, you may again see multiple tiers of flower clusters, um, often three to five heads on a stem um, with two-lipped calyxes or calyces. So again, the, um, the, uh, the calyx is, has formed a tube that has two lips. Um, four nutlets as the fruit that are tucked inside those calyxes. You'll find this in forests, meadows, open plains. Purple giant hyssop um, is a pretty versatile plant. Another mint family member, square stem, with dense spikes at the tips of, um, of the stems. Again, dried calyxes that have the four little nutlets enclosed inside. Um, and as you can see, it does provide food. So th this is actually from my garden a few years ago when we also had snow. Um, and you can see that they're quite lovely in the midst of the snow and covered with snow. And you can see that it's providing food for birds even during the winter. The juncos were, seemed to be really fond of browsing the plants for seeds. Blue vervain, although it um, shares many characteristics with the mint family member, is a different family, it's the vervain family. But it also has square stems, opposite branching, at least in the upper portion of the plant. Um, the inflorescences are very narrow, dense spikes of uh, dried calyxes at the tips. And again, like the mint family members, the fruits are four nutlets tucked inside those calyxes. Uh, the leaves are opposite. Um, the habitat is more moist soil. And again, you can see that insects are being harbored in these plants in the winter. I took the picture of this spider in a January, cold January day. Wild senna, for many reasons, is one of my personal favorite plants because it has so many stories to tell for another time. Um, to identify it, it has typically a single main stem, not usually branched. The inflorescence is a panicle, a branched inflorescence where each flower, or in the case of winter, each fruit has its own stem. The fruit is a legume. Um, that was the fruit that opens along two sutures, so along both sides of this, this fruit that we're seeing here. And uh, the legumes may be segmented, uh, not always, but they may be. And here it's as if, um, well, each seed is sort of tucked into a segment in that legume. The leaves, if they're present, or if you're looking at the leaf scars, are alternate. If there are any leaves still present, they're compound. Um, this does tend to prefer moist soils. Blue false indigo is, plant. Um, is also uh, a plant that produces a legume as its fruit. Um, the flower cluster, or in this case, the fruit cluster, the inflorescence, would be a terminal raceme, that is um, an unbranched flower cluster where each fruit in this case is its own stem. Um, the legume in this case is not segmented. So it does open along both sides of this fruit. Um, there are no segments inside. If the leaves are still present, they are three-parted leaves. And this does kind of prefer moist soil and open woods, beautiful blue flowers. Round-headed bush clover, I just find really beautiful in the winter. Um, there's a single main stem to this plant. There's some branching in the upper portion of the stem and the flower clusters or fruit clusters now are in dense head-like rounded clusters or rounded spikes. Um, there's dried calyxes again at the tips of the stems and in leaf tucked in the leaf axles also. The fruit is a legume, but it's tiny and tucked inside the calyces. Uh, the leaves, if they're present, are alternate and three-parted. And this does prefer moisture soil. This is really quite a stunning plant in the winter, so keep an eye out for it. 
Uh, white beer tongue or foxglove beer tongue is also a plant that is very noticeable in the winter. It's pretty common in um, you know meadow areas, even along roadsides. Has a single main stem uh, with the inflorescence at the top, a panicle, branched uh, flower cluster, or in this case, fruit cluster, where each capsule has, uh, and that is the fruit for this, each capsule has its own stem attaching it. Um, so you can see that this is a dry fruit that opens up when it's ready to disperse its seeds. Um, but it's, it's really kind of a pretty plant to have in your garden in the winter or just to see in a meadow or wherever. Um, the, the fruit capsules have sort of a, a, a glean to them, a shine to them, and they have a woody appearance. The leaves are opposite, and if they're present, they're two. Typically, I don't see leaves in the winter. Um, and this, again, is something that you'll often see in meadows and along roadsides or your own garden. Great St. John's wort. This has such a cool look to it. Um, this is one of the St. John's wort. Um, the stem may be sing uh, just a single stem or it may have some branching towards the top. The fruit is a capsule and they're at the tips of those branches, replacing the um, pollinated and fertilized fruits. Uh, and they produce this wonderful fruit capsule that opens its um, it's dehiscent. It opens when it's ready to disperse its seeds. And to me, they look like little crowns. So they're just very distinctive, really cool. Um, the leaves are opposite and uh, entire. They do not have teeth. And you can see here that you'll often see them clinging to the stem, even in the winter. This uh, does prefer sort of average moisture soil, although you can find it along shores and swamps or rocky banks. The, there are two rose mallow species, and I'm showing both of them tonight on two different slides, just because they have such different looking fruit capsules. They're pretty cool. Um, swamp rose mallow has a single stem that may be branched towards the top, and there would have been a flower at the tips of those stems, which then produce a fruit capsule that opens when it's ready to disperse its seeds. Um, there were apparently five ovaries in these flowers because five um, chambers are found inside the capsule when it opens up, um, which we can see here in these illustrated photographs. Um, the leaves, if present, are alternate and may be shallowly lobed with three lobes. This does definitely prefer moist soil. And the photo over here uh, to the left is an example of an insect using this plant as a place to um, have its eggs survive the winter. And this is actually the egg case of a native praying mantis as opposed to that of uh, the non-native, which is a much more common egg case. So they're harboring insects, even in the winter, providing homes. The um, other rose mallow that's native in our area is halberd-leaved rose mallow. And I just sort of love the appearance of the fruit capsules. As they open up, they will eventually um, kind of lose their out outer structure. And they look to me like little mixer whisk whisks, either a whisk, a hand whisk, or, or really um, the beaters of a mixer. So they're pretty distinctive looking, um, but it, they share some other characteristics with their relative that we just looked at, swamp crows mountain stem, maybe branched towards the top, the fruit capsules are at the top. This again, prefers moist habitat. Evening primrose, a fairly common plant, um, again, a really cool plant, a single plant that, uh, sorry, a single stem that maybe branched towards the top. Um, the inflorescence or flower cluster is a spike. Um, the uh, uh, capsule, the fruit is a capsule. So it, it opens to disperse its seeds when ready. If the leaves are present or you can still see traces, they're alternate. There is, um, this plant also produces a basal rosette, um, a rosette of leaves at the base of the plant. And that you may see, this is a biennial. And so you may see a basal rosette one year and then the actual plant the following year, the rest of the plant the following year. You may see this, it's often seen along roadsides and in fields. Okay, this is seed box and this is such a cool plant. Um, it gets its name because its fruit is just so cool. And so I'm gonna focus on the fruit right now because it's really neat. Um, well, okay, the plant is a single stem, usually not branched, um, 
but we can see the inflorescence at the top. It's uh, a raceme that has, uh, it, it's basically unbranched. Each fruit capsule has its own stem. And each of those little fruit capsules are so cool. They look like little teeny wooden boxes that were carved by a, a, a wildflower fairy or something. Um, there's these wonderful markings on the tops of the fruit capsules. And so in the corner, there are seams to this fruit capsule and the, the, um, they will open at those seams to, re, to produce, to allow the seeds to disperse. They're also through this hole in the center. But let's talk about where these markings came from. In the four corners, there are scars that are left because that's where the, um, the petals were attached. In the middle of the sides, there are scars from where the stamens were attached to this plant. And these um, sort of oval markings are where the nectaries were. And in the very center, that's the opening um, or the, uh, the place where the pistil was attached. And the seeds are dispersed from both the pistil and by the, these um, seams opening up to release the seeds. But it's just, I think, just such a cool, uh, a cool fruit capsule. And this does prefer moist meadows, uh, moisture habitats. A few grasses were still in the mode of meadow. One is uh, switchgrass, which we can plant. The height varies depending on how happy it is in that particular um, habitat. The fruit capsules or the, the inflorescence is a fruit, uh, a panicle of spikelets, tiny little spikes. Um, the fruits for all the grasses are um, caryopsis. Um, this can reproduce through colonies, so sometimes you'll see a, a dense cluster of them. It's a pretty distinctive uh, looking plant, even in the winter. It basically looks like it does in the summer, only shades of tan. In the winter, it provides food for lots of animals, mice, voles, many birds, as does Indian grass, which we see a um, Chipping sparrow here eating some of the seeds from the Indian grass. Uh, again, in this case of Indian grass, the inflorescence is a narrow panicle of spikelets, pretty distinctive. Uh, the height can vary, but it can be up to seven feet. Um, this is mostly found in drier habitats and again produces seeds for lots of birds. And all of these plants too can be places where insects are um, seeking refuge during the winter. Um, the inflorescence of purple top is kind of a, a relaxed panicle of spikelets. Um, you can often see this, you may see this as singular plants, or you may see it as a whole colony, possibly even filling a meadow. Um, it, it tolerates lots of different habitats in terms of level of moisture. And it is often seen along roadsides or in meadows. Blue stem and uh, switchgrass, switch I'm sorry, blue stem and the next species are pretty similar looking, um, but little blue stem has uh, racemes of spikelets that sort of curve away from the, uh, the main stem of the plant. And you can see that its fruits have uh, fluffy pappas to help disperse the seeds. Broom sedge is similar looking. When these plants are during the growing season, they look very similar until they begin to flower or fruit. Broom sedge, the seeds or fruits are sort of tucked in the leaves um, of the stem. Both can be found in meadows and along roadsides. We're gonna skip questions until the end, just a few more species. Um, if we're now looking in woodland species, uh, smooth rock crest is, uh, um, uh, an example of something that could be found as a, a spring ephemeral in the woodland understory, but it does still hang around to disperse its seeds. And the fruit capsule of this type of uh, plant, if you recall, is called a silic. Um, it opens up along two sutures and has a partition in the center. And it's just that partition that we see left in the, in the winter. And that the seeds are actually attached to the partition. And here we can see a few still attached. So it is still dispersing its seeds. Woodland understory species. Food plant for the caterpillars of the falcate orange tip butterfly. 
Um, beet drops you may be familiar with as being a plant that you'll typically see, you'll only see in conjunction with beech trees because it is actually a parasite on beech tree roots. It gets its food from beech tree roots and can't survive without them. Um, the fruit is a capsule. It's a small branched fruit and is especially visible against the snow as it might be today. Um, striped wintergreen, this actually has many aliases, also sometimes called spotted wintergreen. Um, it's also another common name is Pipsisua, but there's another species that has that common name if I've heard to use that. Um, this species has pretty distinctive striped leaves, um, thus the name striped wintergreen. Um, it is evergreen, you will see those leaves even in the winter. Um, you'll see a stem at the tip of which there are fruit capsules that open up to release the seeds. They have the shape of little teeny tiny um, winter squash. They're really cool, very pretty. And this is again, a woodland understory plant. Uh, another plant that's a woodland understory plant that might be more difficult to see today because it's more of a ground cover, but it is evergreen. You'll see these leaves even in the, the winter with their pretty distinctive um, lighter colored midrib. And you may see the fruit of partridge berry. Um, one of the distinctive characteristics of this fruit is that it has two scars um, from calyx calyxes. And that's because this is sort of an interesting flower structure. There are actually two flowers that share a single ovary and that ovary produces the fruit. And you can see the scars from the other parts of the flowers here. Um, it's a really lovely little ground cover. Another plant that you actually begin to see in the fall, I usually see the leaf begin to emerge from fallen leaves of uh, the trees, the deciduous trees around it in about November. This is putty root, one of our native orchid species, has a very distinctive leaf. It produces only one leaf. That leaf, as I said, emerges in um, the fall, in November typically. Uh, it has sort of a pleated look to it, and it's a green and white striped leaf. And that's the only leaf it has. It will photosynthesize with that leaf even during the winter. And if this is a, a plant that actually uh, flowered and produced fruit the previous year, you'll still see the stem from the previous year's flower and at its tip, the fruit capsule. But putty root and the next species I'm gonna mention don't bloom every year. They're very finicky about when they bloom. They can go for many years um, and without blooming, without emerging and blooming. But you may still see the leaf even if it chooses not to bloom. You'll see this in uh, rich, moist woods, a uh, woodland understory native orchid. Uh, crane fly orchid shares some of the same habits of uh, putty root. And that is that uh, the leaf emerges in the fall. You'll only see it in the fall. And I should have also mentioned that the leaf dies back by the time the flower um, structure emerges and produces flowers, and now fruits. Um, crane fly orchid does the same thing. Flower is very distinctive very noticeable veining, very distinct um, veining in these leaves. And the underside of the leaf is a deep purple, which is kind of distinctive and pretty cool looking. Um, again, a woodland understory native orchid. Skunk cabbage, everybody looks for this. The leaves of skunk cabbage actually emerge probably again in about November. You'll begin to see the tips of the leaves of skunk cabbage and a bit later, um, I don't think they're showing right now. I, I noticed the leaves a week or two ago, but I have not yet seen the flower structures beginning to emerge, but they do emerge in the late winter and will even bloom in the late winter. Um, so the, the green cone-like shaped are the leaves emerging and this sort of maroon and yellow structure is the flower structure beginning to emerge. It's the spathe um, that protects the spadix inside which is where the flowers are found. And it's not that often that you'll see the fruits in the winter. If you do see the fruit, it looks like what we see in the lower right corner here. And it's actually a type of berry, um, but a multiple fruit um, that is, uh, the components are joined by um, each of the tiny individual flowers that you'll see attached to the uh, spadix in the growing season. 
And this is definitely uh, an obligate wetland plant. A few ferns. Christmas fern is probably the most famous of the evergreen ferns. It's the most common. Um, it has multiple fronds and each front has multiple leaflets or pinny that um, have sort of a distinctive little crook at the end closest to the stem. Uh, the leaves have very small, uh, sharp teeth. Um, and you will probably usually not see the reproductive parts, the sori. They're typically at the tips of a pond and have um, done their thing by the winter and have kind of most signs of them have disappeared. Um, you'll see this in woodland understories. One, another species that looks sort of similar is uh, the polypody that we see here. In this case, you will see, again, it's an evergreen fern. Um, there's, it's missing that little hook that we saw on Christmas fern. And on the underside, you do see the sori. So the fertile fronds will show the sori. This likes uh, rocky woods with rich soil, um, often near decaying wood. Marginal wood fern is, fern is another fairly common fern in uh, a woodland understory. And this species has um, evergreen fronds. The leaflets are uh, have sort of rounded teeth and you will see evidence of the sori on the underside. And that will be, they will be along the edges of the pinnae, thus the name marginal wood fern. You'll see evidence of sensitive fern during the winter, but just the um, evidence of the fertile fronds. Sensitive fern has separate fertile fronds and um, vegetative fronds. The vegetative fronds, gone. The fertile fronds are still there. Um, the pinny for them are rolled up around the uh, sori in, in sort of a round shape, very distinctive in the winter. Similar, is ostrich fern, only in this case, the clusters of sori take on the appearance of a feather, thus the name ostrich fern. Both are uh, like moist soil, both of those species. Another pretty cool distinctive species in the winter is uh, wild yam, which is a vine. Its fruit is very distinctive. It has uh, sort of three wings. Um, it's a capsule with three wings that open up. So again, three ovaries. If you still see the leaves, uh, evidence of the leaves, they are alternate and heart-shaped. Heart -shaped. And I always see this in woodland understories. Witch hazel is a winter blooming plant, probably pretty much done by now. It typically blooms between October and maybe early January at the latest, um, but you should at least still see some uh, fruit capsules. The um, fruit capsules from last year would be open up to have dispersed the seeds. They are capsules. They open when they're ready to disperse their seeds. And um, it actually takes about a year for those seeds to, uh, for the capsules to open up and the seeds to be dispersed. So at the time that witch hazel is blooming, the capsules from the previous year will open up to disperse their seeds. Very cool kind of brambly plant is coral berry or Indian currant. Uh, a kind of inconspicuous plant during the summer but during the winter, it has clusters of this magenta fruit that are very eye-catching. So while other plants maybe had their uh, moment of attention during the growing season, this one is very distinctive during the, the winter. Um, and this does uh, reproduce through stolons as well as through its fruits. Um, the fruit is a droop. That is uh, the type of fruit that's similar to a peach, has a stony um, case encasement for its seed inside. The, this is, um, uh, has opposite leaves if you still see evidence of them. And this does prefer drier soils. Rose hips, um, they look a lot like um, a berry, but they're a hip, it's a multiple fruit really. Um, inside uh, there are multiple achenes resulting from multiple ovaries from each rose flower. Um, the flowers, uh, sorry, the leaves at present are alternate and compound. Red, 
<laughs> excuse me, red chokeberry. I have some at the end of my driveway that um, the robins were nibbling on the fruit recently, but they haven't completely decimated it yet. Um, this is a species that does keep its fruit throughout much of the winter or the early part of the winter. And robins or cedar wax wings may descend upon them to strip the shrubs late in the winter when there's less food to eat and when this has become more delectable. Bright red uh, fruits, very pretty. The fruit is a palm. That is the type of fruit that's uh, similar to an apple. Um, the seeds are in the center encased in sort of a, a papery enclosure. Leaves are simple, alternate, and if they're present, you'll see that they have fine teeth. This does prefer moist soil, but it's fairly versatile because, as I said, it's at the end of my driveway and doing pretty well. Winterberry holly, can't miss it during the winter. Again, keeps its fruit uh, throughout much of the, at least early part of the winter. Um, the fruit here is apparently under some dispute. Some botanists refer to it as a berry, some as a droop. Um, we'll call it a berry-like droop, split the difference. Uh, the leaves are alternate, if you can see them, and this does prefer moist habitats, but again, it does really well in lots of different um, habitats, including my garden outside here in the Sourland Mountains. Wild hydrangea, I just love it any time of the year, and it has this lovely um, cluster of fruit capsules that uh, open to disperse their seeds. So why should we use native plants? because they're essential to all life and the ecosystem in which they involve, evolved. We should each be using native plants, encourage others to use them and remove invasive species. And these are just a few of the uh, resources that I used. They're the primary resources that I used. And I wanted to just especially recommend um, a guide to wildflowers in winter for identifying um, winter uh, herbaceous plants in winter. They're also great for grasses and ferns. I mean, they're really good. So um, anyway, these are some of the resources that I used. And with that, I would open it up for questions if there are any, just a few minutes over, not too bad. There are a few questions. Um, Ellen, are you on? I don't think she's on. So we have a question from Alice. Uh, when collecting seeds, um, how are the dry fruits treated differently from the soft fruits? And she said she tries to remove the soft flesh but can't remove the dry fruit coatings. Um, it's going to vary depending on the species because those that are capsules, I mean, so many of them open on their own to disperse their seeds. So you want to, I mean, first of all, I should say that I'm, um, not necessarily an expert in uh, collecting seeds, but uh, if you're collecting them in the wild, you should always make sure that you have permission to do that. And um, there are many differences. There are many of the dry fruits that open on their own um, to re release their seeds when the fruit is ripe. Those you could really just sort of, you know, open up and shape them into your hand. Um, those that are, um, indehiscent that don't open on their own. Um, uh, you know, I think you, I'm not an expert in that. I think you need to do a little bit of research on um, how that particular fruit, what it does in nature. Um, you know, because the seeds are gonna have to open up eventually. I mean, the fruits are gonna have to open up to release the seeds. But anyway, uh, sorry, I can't be of more help, but many of the dry, fruits do open up and you can just collect the seeds when they're open. Um, that's the easiest way. It's about the best I can do on that, sorry. And, so, uh, go ahead. Yes, yeah, so Laura, yeah, so Laura um, um, oh. she says she still on a quest to see the seed pod of the seed box and she asks if there's been any uh, sightings recently at Bowman's Hill. Um, yeah, I can tell you too places to look, Laura. One is Bowman's Hill in the meadow, in the lower part of the meadow where the it's more moist. Um, there is some seed box there. There could be some in the Aquatong meadow too that I'm less certain of, but there might, actually I think there is, I'm almost certain there is. So check out either of the meadows in the, the original meadow, the south meadow, look in the lower part, the, um, you know, closer to the entrance. Um, and in Aquatong meadow, just wander around until you find it because it is in there too. 
The other place that I've seen it is um, Cedar Ridge Preserve, if you know where that is, just outside of Hopewell and Hopewell Township. You'll see it there too. Um, so that maybe will help you a little bit in your quest. But they're definitely worth seeing. They're such cool little fruits. So, so <laughs> oh, what is it? If there is an index for the habitat acronyms, um, the upper uh, upper uh, upper obligate wetlands or, or any right the, the yeah. fish U.S. Fish and Wildlife. I'm, I actually opened the chat here too, and I can see it. Can you guys see that? I opened the chat. Can you see that? Is it? I was just curious. Um, anyway, if you go back to that slide, or I can go back to that slide for you if you like. But um, there's a definition of them, and there's sort of two extremes. Um, one is obligate wetland. Um, you can look this up just about anywhere. Just um, Google U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service uh, wetland codes. Um, that should get it for you. But they're fairly simple. OVL is one extreme, and that is that this is an obligate wetland plant. Most of the time, you're going to find this in a wetland, 99% of the time. Up extent is UPL which is um, an obligate upland plant. It prefers drier soils. You're gonna see it more in dry upland areas. And the other three are gradations in between. Um, you know, might be more often in a wetland plant, a wetland area, but could be in a drier area too. And then there's the FAC is sort of, eh, I kind of like average soils, that sort of thing. You'll sometimes also see them with a plus or minus and plus takes that categorization a little bit closer to the wetland end, the minus takes it a little bit away from the wetland end in that category. Um, but they, on the slide that I showed them, I kind of went through it quickly, but um, there is a definition. And if you want me to, I'll go back to it. it wouldn't even take that long. Here. My cat Emma has just joined me, but here's the, uh, Decoder, the secret decoder, if that helps. Anything else? Uh, I don't think there are any more questions. Okay. Well, I hope you all, so, all survive no tomorrow. So thank you so much, uh, Marianne, for this. This is wonderful. Um, I just want to say um, that we do have another webinar coming up in um, in February, and you can look on our Somerset County uh, chapter page. I'll put it in the Q&A. It's going to be Wild in the Garden State. And uh, also, if you uh, want to get our newsletter, uh, you can sign up, and I will also put that in the Q&A so you have both. So um, let me put that in here right now. I do actually see one more question. Where can the crane fly orchids be found? Oh, it just um, came in. Okay. Um, yes, yes. Where can the crane fly orchids be found? They're woodland understory, and they're, I've never really seen them, um, you know, like in big colonies. They're, I've only seen them, and maybe just my experience, but I've only seen them like in individual flowers. Um, they're woodland understory plants. They're, these orchids are pretty interesting. Um, the crane fly and the putty root in that they um, don't bloom every year. I mean, they just, like, oh, maybe I'll put my leaf up and maybe I'll bloom this year, maybe I won't. So they're really kind of hard to find. They're kind of tricky to find. If you find one, it's a gift. Um, but they're, they're woodland understory orchids. My experience doesn't mean it's the only way that they grow, but my experience is that they're typically, you know, sort of one off, not in little colonies. So. I don't know how much that helps. They're tricky to find. So. And then Lee had a question about uh, do some seeds pass through the animal's animentary canal? Um, you know, uh, of the species that we looked at tonight, I don't know that any are required to go through the elementary canal, but those species that have fleshy fruits, typically have evolved to attract um, animals to eat the seeds, eat the fruits and disperse, you know, the seeds with fertilizer. Um, 
So the odds are that they get some benefit from going through other than dispersal. They may get some other benefit. They certainly get the fertilizer that they're dispersed with. Um, I don't know if, they're, if they get striations or not, they may. I mean, I know I've read of that with um, uh, May apple, but, uh, with, and that's with the um, box turtle. So it's entirely possible that other fruits that produce, other plants that produce fleshy fruits get some benefit to the seeds by going through, they get many benefits. They get dispersed, they get fertilizer. There may also be some striation going on. Um, I wouldn't be surprised, but I don't know for a fact. Okay. I think that was everything. Okay. I'm having a little trouble getting anything into the chat. It seems to be disabled, so I can't um, I can't send the uh, the information about the uh, newsletter sign up, but you can. Uh, you can check the website. Uh, our chapter page has the uh, has the link. Okay, I think that was everything. Again, uh, Marianne, thank you so much, and we look forward to seeing you again. Thanks for inviting me, and um, thanks everybody for part your attention and for participating. And enjoy the snow tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> okay. The wildflowers in winter. That's right. We're looking for them now. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Okay, Bye. -bye. Bye.